Shall we rise up, please? I want you to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer. That the Bible study today will be beneficial to you. And that the Lord himself will reveal his mind to you. Preparing you and preparing every one of us for the coming of the Lord. I want to hear you pray. Open your mouth and pray. In all the other locations where you are listening now, we need to rise up on our feet and talk to the Lord in prayer. That are coming to the Bible study will really benefit us and lift us up, prepare us for the great event that is coming, which is the rapture of the church. That the Lord will count us worthy to escape the great tribulation which is coming upon this world. And not only that we'll be fully and well prepared, but the people that listen to us, the people we share with, they too will be prepared by the Lord through our teaching and also through the example of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We thank you because you've gathered us together so that we can study your word. Thank you for the revelation of your word. And thank you because the Spirit has always been revealing to us verse after verse and chapter after chapter the great things that are to happen at the end of time. And Lord, as we're going through all these studies, we pray that we'll never remain the same in Jesus' name. That Lord, the blood of Jesus will wash us from all uncleanness. And the fire of the Holy Ghost will pour fire, zeal, and passion in every one of us to, fear, to be fully prepared. And to help in preparing others for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. I pray, O Lord, that you help us not to toy, not to play with these great revelations and truths you are revealing to us week after week and day after day in Jesus' name. Once again today, as we come, we're praying that your word will be revealed to every heart, that your spirit will impress and impart all these things to our hearts, and we will be stronger for what we learn and study in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all be seated. Today we're in Revelation chapter 16. You remember that we studied uh, the first part of chapter 16 last week, if you were here. And we read and we actually studied from verse 1 all through to verse 11. Seven angels holding seven vials of the wrath of God. And then the angels were commanded to pour out that rose or that vial, that bowl of rose upon the world, the world that will be, the earth that will be at the time of the great tribulation. And then what we're looking at today is the outpouring of the vials of these angels, the sixth angel and the seventh angel, are pouring out their vials or their bowls of throb at this time we're studying. That is now in Revelation chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 12. Please open your Bible and follow through with me. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of, the, of devils walking miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to, battle of the, to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he shall walk, lest he walk naked and he see shame. And he gathered them together unto a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his veil into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And a great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, and every island fled away. 
and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hill out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hill for the plague thereof was exceeding great that's the passage we're looking at today and as you look at verse 12 you will see let me read the verse 12 again you'll see it says and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the of the east might be prepared that's why you see the title of the subject we're looking at today preparation for the great battle of Armageddon preparation for the great battle of Armageddon there is going to be a decisive battle it's going to be a great battle as the period of the great tribulation will be getting to its end it is the great battle of Armageddon and you see that as you look at verse 14 it says in verse 14 for they are the spirits of devils walking miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle to the battle of that great day of god almighty in verse 16 and he gathered them together into a place called in the hebrew tongue amageddon we're told that uh, the word Armageddon is actually made of two Hebrew words, meaning the mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo was a town belonging to Manasseh. Although within the limits of Issachar, you find that in Joshua chapter 17, verse 11, after it was conquered and destroyed, it was rebuilt again and fortified by Solomon. That's First Kings chapter 9, verse 15. It was at Megiddo that Deborah and Barak defeated Sisera and his host. Judges chapter 5, verse 19. And it was in that same place that the battle was fought that made Josiah to lose his life. He was actually slain there by Pharaoh Necho. Second Kings chapter 23, verses 29 and 30. There was a great mourning for, the, for Joshua. And any other grievous morning was likened to the morning in the valley of Megiddo. Megiddo then was a mountainous region. Though the battles were fought in an adjacent valley. Actually, Napoleon called it that place uh, the greatest place of a battlefield. The great events of the Great Tribulation will culminate in the battle of Armageddon, despite the physical suffering and the trauma of that time. That is, of the time of the Great Tribulation, there will still be men, multitudes of them, thousands and millions of them, they will be unrepentant. They would have been influenced by the spirits of Satan, of the Antichrist, and of the false prophet. And because of that, they will gather in battle against the Lord God Almighty. It's very surprising as you look at the way the history of the world will end, as you look at the way the history of the world will come to an a close or come to a climax, that even though the judgment of God will be upon the people of the world at that time, something will happen, or many, many things will be happening that had never, never happened before. It will be a time of great wrath, a great indignation, and the great judgment of God. And as great as the indignation and the judgment and the wrath of God will be, you'll be surprised that unrepentant men will still remain unrepentant. In fact, it says in what we're studying today, they will gather themselves together against the Lord, fighting against the Lord. Can you imagine people fighting against the Lord? That's exactly what they will do at that time. They will do that and it will be all the kings of the earth, all the kings of the whole world, political leaders and military leaders and people that are highly placed in every area of life. They'll gather together saying we're going to fight it out. Instead of the judgment of God, instead of the wrath of God, instead of the indignation of God melting their heart to so submission, they will still want to be fighting against the Lord. But will that be the first time that human, humans or human beings will try to fight against God? No, not at all. It has always been like that. Men and women opposing God, striving against God, fighting against God, coming into battle in warfare against the Almighty God. Why don't you turn your Bible to Psalm 2 and see what the Lord had said, even looking at it from behind. That is from long time ago. In Psalm 2, I'm reading to you from verse 2. Psalm 2, verse 2. 
It tells us that the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's what the Lord said, that men were doing at that time. And when Jesus came, that's exactly what the Jewish people did. They didn't want the will of God. They were striving and fighting in battle against the revelation of the will of God. And then at the close of the age, at the close of time, that's exactly what people are going to do. They are going to gather themselves together. And they're going to say they are fighting against the Lord Almighty. We're told in Isaiah chapter 45 isaiah chapter 45 reading from verse 9 it says woe unto him that striveth with his maker woe unto him that striveth with his maker and that's an individual unto him fighting against striving against battling against his maker and you know there are people that are fighting individually against the lord when the lord calls you to repentance to salvation and you resist and you reject and you fight it and say no it will not be you're fighting against the lord when the lord gives you a commandment and say no i'm going to do my will i'm going to go my own way you're fighting against the lord and it says that there's going to be judgment and indignation and wrath against the people that are fighting against their maker woe unto him that striveth with his maker but that's what the people will do and then the judgment of god will fall upon them as they fight against the lord in any generation at any time when you find people that are resisting the will of god and they're fighting against the lord that's exactly what happens to them the lord crushes them the lord destroys them the lord judges them the lord pours out his indignation and wrath upon them in amos i'm looking at verse chapter 4 in verse 6 amos chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 6 it says and i also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places yet have ye not turned unto me says the lord the lord is saying here that even though he had punished the people chastised the people disciplined the people and he had rebuked the people he had even withdrawn from them the provision that he had for them before and he laid farming upon them what he called cleanness of teeth there is that there wasn't any food to eat there wasn't any bread to take and therefore their mouths were clean because they were not eating anything and yet even with the famine and the judgment of god coming upon them yet they will not turn unto the lord what is that striving against god what is that fighting against god what is that holding arms in battle against the almighty god in haggai chapter 2 Agai chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 17. He's still telling us the same thing, that men and women in the world, if they're not born again, if they're not converted, if their hearts are hardened and not softened at all towards the Lord, here is what they do. They fight against the Lord. And even when the Lord smites them, even when the Lord rebukes them, even when the Lord is correcting them with fears, anger, and judgment, they still continue in their rebellion, fighting against the Lord. That's why the Lord is telling us that if at this day we're hearing the word of the Lord, we shouldn't hide in our heart. We shouldn't do like the people will do at the time of the great tribulation, that even though the wrath and the judgment and the wrath of God, indignation of God will be poured out upon them, instead of melting down in submission and in repentance, they'll still be fighting against the will and the word of the Lord. In Agai chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 17, I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands yet ye turned not to me says the lord the lord rebuked them the lord chastised them and yet they did not turn unto the lord oh you say maybe it's because uh, the judgments were so terrible that they were so discouraged do you know that even when the lord showed mercy unto them the mercy did not turn them unto the lord and you tell me when the mercy of god will not turn a person to the lord and the judgment of god will not turn him to the lord when the punishment will not turn him and the infinite love of god will not turn him to the lord there is no hope for that individual infinite love 
beckoning on them, come, I love you. And then on the other hand, eternal judgment stirring them in the face, and yet neither the right nor the left, neither the love nor the punishment, chastisement will turn them to the Lord. There is no hope for such people. It's like they have wielded their souls unto the devil. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 20, Matthew chapter 11, and I'm reading to you from verse 20. It tells us here in verse 20, Then began he to upbraid, to rebuke, to chastise the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Miracles they saw, provisions they received, the mercy of God they experienced, and yet with all the love and the miracle and the mercy, they will not turn to the Lord. They did not repent. And that's what will be happening to the people in those days, in the days of old. That is, in the days of uh, the great tribulation. Although the Lord will chastise them, although he will punish them, and even when he brings protection for them, and he tries to win them and woo them by his love, yet they will not turn to the Lord. We're praying that our hearts will not be like that. I said our hearts will not be like that. But you know the people of the world, they are, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil and nothing will correct them and nothing will convert them because they have wielded themselves to the evil one. We divide the study today to three parts. Number one, deceptive wonders and power of counterfeit religion deceptive wonders and power of counterfeit religion number two diligent watchfulness and preparedness for christ's return diligent watchfulness and preparedness for christ's return number three devastating warfare and punishment of contemptuous reprobates devastating warfare and punishment of contemptuous reprobates we come to uh, Revelation again, chapter 16. In Revelation chapter 16, we're looking at it from verse 12. It tells us in verse 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Here we learn uh, what uh, will be happening as the first angel poured out. Uh, you've studied that already. The judgment that came. And the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And it comes to the sixth angel now. And these things are just coming in rapid succession. And they had no way to rest or to breathe at all. Because it was the time of the fury and the judgment of God. And there was no respite. And there will be no rest at all. And as the sixth angel will pour out its veil. Then the river Euphrates will be dried up. Why will it be dried up? So that the people are coming from the east. That is the people that want to fight against the Lord. The Lord will make the way for them. The Lord will say, you want to fight? Come on now. I'm going to make up the way for you. You want to rebel against the almighty God and blaspheme him and carry arms against the almighty God so that you'll have your way? Come on now. I'm going to open the river for you. And like, the, like Pharaoh, and the chariots and the horsemen of Egyptians like they did. That when they saw the Red Sea opened up, they were not afraid. They rushed in and moved in. That's exactly what the people are going to do in those uh, final days as the Lord will open up river Euphrates and then they'll pass over so that they can come to uh, Palestine and when they come to Palestine it is there they'll be fighting against the Lord now but let's look at verse 13 verse 13 and verse 14 and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and of the mouth out of the mouth of the of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of the, to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. 
from what we have read over there, you will see that uh, the devil will really do some supernatural things at that time. Uh, you have read there, we read it together. Three unclean spirits coming out, they're demons. And number one, they come out of the mouth of the dragon. That's out of the mouth of Satan. Number two, out of the mouth of the beast. That's out of the mouth of the Antichrist. And then number three, out of the mouth of the false prophet. That is, the Antichrist's associate that they will produce deceptive miracles and it is those deceptive miracles that will convince the kings of the earth and the kings of the whole world to gather in battle against the almighty god lying wonders deceptive miracles done by false prophets always instigate people to oppose the true gospel and fight against the god of truth and it is not only at the time of the great tribulation those things have been prophesied in fact you know they've been happening how many times say since the time of the old testament that there were people that didn't have the real spirit of god they didn't have the truth of god they didn't have experience with god they didn't have reconciliation with god relationship with god and yet they were performing miracles and if you're a person searching for miracles and running after miracles, you're going to be surprised because you can easily be deceived. Let's look at the scriptures. Let's look at what the scripture is telling us in the word of God. It tells us in First John, First John chapter 4. It's telling us that it's not every miracle that comes from God. It's not every miracle, every supernatural sign and wonder that comes from the Almighty God. That's the reason even in the days in which we're living now, we ought to be very careful and very watchful so that we do not destroy ourselves or get deceived because of those lying wonders. It tells us in First John chapter 4, reading from verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. That somebody says he has a spirit doesn't mean he has the Holy Spirit. There are many, many kinds of spirits. That's why it says, try the spirits whether they are of God. In verse 2, hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ is, is come in the flesh is of, is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. There is a spirit of the Antichrist. And that's exactly what we're reading in Revelation chapter 16. A demon, an evil spirit coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Out of the mouth of the beast. Out of the mouth of the false prophet. And these three evil spirits, they work miracles. And they work miracles to the point that those miracles convince the kings of the earth. And the kings of the whole world. That they rise in battle against the almighty God. There is the spirit of the antichrist. Wherefore ye have heard that it shall come. And even now already is it in the world. Even now already. Even before the time of the great tribulation. There is the devil casting a shadow. There is the Antichrist or the spirit of the Antichrist casting a shadow before him. It is already in the world. That's why we ought to be warned. In fact, we are told in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading to you from verse 20. It tells us, repeating it again, that the spirit of the Antichrist actually works miracles. It says in chapter 19 verse 20, and the beast was taken. And we see the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. The beast was taken. We see the false prophet. What did the false prophet do that wrought miracles before him? And it says that had received the mark and, did, and which had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image they both were cast alive into a lake of a lake of fire burning with brimstone you will see then the end of all those prophets and the things that will be happening at the time of the great tribulation now you'll see i've omitted some verses there i did that on purpose i'm not going to go through those verses now what do these uh, miracles actually do and what are these uh, miracles called the miracles are called lying wonders 
lying wonders and lying wonders are supposed to deceive and therefore as we see the things happening even at this time now because we have read it already in first john chapter 4 that that spirit of the antichrist is already in the world today what do they do uh, number one there is the deception of counterfeit miracles the deception of counterfeit miracles actually when those counterfeit miracles take place they deceive and if you're a person running after those miracles, you're going to be deceived. And you're going to be taken out, jolted out, removed out of the way of righteousness. Because your heart will go astray. Your mind will go astray. If the most important thing to you is that you want to see wonders, you want to see signs, you want to see miracles, and you don't care from what direction that miracle is coming from, you are going to be deceived. Number one, the deception of counterfeit miracles. I read again from Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16 verse 13 and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Remember the spirit coming out of the mouth of the false prophet and all false prophets of all times they are the spirits of the devil and then it says for they are the spirits of devils walking miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle against the great day of, of, of God Almighty. You see what those miracles do? Lying, wonder, deceptive miracles, counterfeit miracles. They deceive people and they make people to fight against God against the truth against the gospel against sound doctrine if you have uh, met some people that have seen some miracles counterfeit miracles lying wonders and you invite them to church and you invite them to know the truth and you invite them to be born again or you invite them to holiness without which no man shall see the lord they'll say what are you talking about i can show you miracles and they begin to tell you stories a time when they were sick a time when they were demon possessed. A time when somebody conducted a deliverance for them. A time when the doctor said he couldn't have a child and miraculously they had a child. And these things might be coming from deceptive spirits, counterfeit miracles they are. And so, let us be very careful of the deception of deceptive miracles. Look at Revelation chapter 13. Reading from verse 13, Revelation chapter 13, reading from verse 13, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast that which had which at the wound by the sword and did live and he had power to give life to the image of the beast think about a miracle that just an image had been made a lifeless image a lifeless idol a lifeless thing just constructed by somebody and then this miracle worker has power to give life if he's able to do that then he can raise the dead he can do a lot of things and people will be running after that and they forget salvation and they forget sanctification and they forget holiness and they forget that without holiness no man shall see the lord they have seen miracle 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 and they're running after that they are deceived already number two what do those counterfeit miracles do number two it brings denial of christ's miracles it brings denials of Christ's miracles. You see, when some people have seen some counterfeit miracles, they will not believe the genuine. They will say, well, everything is coming from the devil. And that's exactly what some people say concerning the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, I'm reading to you from verse 22 to verse 24. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Reading from verse 22, it says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil blind and dumb and he healed him in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and so and all the people were amazed and said is not this the son of david but the pharisees heard it when the pharisees said it they said this fellow does not cast out devils but by bears above the prince of devils you see, when some people have seen counterfeit miracles and they know that those people are not living right, they are committing fornication, they are committing adultery, but they prophesy. 
And they have uh, many, many wives. They are polygamists, and yet they are performing miracles. The people that have seen that, and they have seen that, this is all deception. When the true miracle actually comes, and the ministry of Christ actually comes forth, people are not going to believe. They'll say they are all of the same, birds of the same feather. They are doing it by the same evil power. It causes the denial of Christ's miracles. Number three, it causes distraction from Christ's message. You see, when miracles, miracles, miracles eh, happen, and it is coming from the wrong source, the people, they forget the message of Jesus, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. They forget that. All that's important now is the counterfeit miracle. And then they forget that blessed are the pure in heart, eh, and they shall see the Lord. They forget all that. Is that important anymore? And they forget restitution. And they forget sound doctrine. Because counterfeit miracles have the tendency of distracting from Christ's message. In Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 Not everyone that says unto me Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven Many will say to me in that day Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name have done many wonderful works These people are distracted They are distracted from the real thing from the essential thing from the scene that takes us to heaven. They drop the ticket that takes them to heaven. They, talk, they drop the new birth experience. They drop the sanctification holiness experience. And all the things they are running after will be miracle, miracle, miracle. They are distracted from Christ's central message. And then on the last day Jesus said, they will say, many will say, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Didn't we walk miracles in your name and do many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Number four, it brings disregard of Christ's ministers. You see, when some people come to town, and then they are showing counterfeit miracles. The, pe the people that are standing for the truth, the people that are preaching the truth, the people that are saying, come unto the Lord. Let him cleanse you. Let him wash you. Let him change your life. Let him turn you around. Let him prepare you for heaven. Have the grace of God in your life and then become a new creature in Christ. Oh, those people are going to disregard them. We're talking about, um, you know, feeding the hungry. We're talking about healing the sick. We're talking about deliverance. We're talking about prosperity. We're talking about miracles and you are talking about born again, born again restitution. What is all that? You see, the people will disregard Christ's ministers in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. I'm reading to you there from verse 9. And see what, uh, you know, these counterfeit miracles will do. Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. You see, if you are not, uh, you know, showing any kind of signs and wonders, you are not performing any miracle, you are just teaching the word of God like John the Baptist. And you are telling them to escape from the judgment of God and to escape from the wrath to come. And you are telling them the axe is laid already to the root of the tree. And every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit shall be cut down, hewn down, and thrown into the fire. And you are like John the Baptist just, uh, you know, saying the word of God. It is not right for you to take your brother's wife and then every time they come it's about salvation it's about repentance it's about righteousness it's about preparing to meet the lord your god and then there's somebody in town a great man a great one a miracle worker the people are going to disregard you they say we don't want all that message of holiness and righteousness is that what we're going to eat is that where we're going to be sitting down uh, we're talking about you know solving our problems removing our mountain and breaking our yokes and you are talking about repentance and heaven who cares about repentance let me get healed that's what was happening here in verse 11 to him they had regard because of that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries 
But thank God, eventually Philip came. And when Philip came, the power that Philip manifested went beyond the power of that false person there. And then the people were able to come. But number five, it brings delusion on compromising miracle seekers. Delusion on compromising miracle seekers. There are some people, they are miracle seekers. The only thing they are looking for, if they come to any church, they say, I came here, I didn't come for teaching. I didn't come for study. I didn't come for um, transformation. I didn't come for being a new creature. I came for miracle. Anywhere I see miracle, I will stay there. There are some compromising miracle seekers. And those people are going to be deluded. Delusion is going to come upon them, especially in these last days when the devil is raising up counterfeit miracle workers. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9. Even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You see that? Those wonders, they tell you lies. Those wonders, they deceive you. The lying wonders and with all deceivableness of a righteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They don't want salvation. They are not looking for regeneration. They are not looking for the opportunity and privilege that the grace of God will come to them and their names will be written in the book of life. All they are looking for is counterfeit, miracle, lying wonders, deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Number one, I told you, deception of counterfeit miracles. Number two, denial of Christ's miracles. Number three, distraction from Christ's message. And number four, disregard of Christ's ministers. Then number five, delusion of compromising miracle seekers. Number six, demonization of countless miracle seekers that is serious demonization of countless miracle seekers do you know what happens to people that are seeking for miracles and they want to see miracles at any cost and they don't care they can sell their souls into the hands of the devil all they just want to see is this line wonders all they want to see is this kind of magic all they want to see is the counterfeit thing that the spirit of the devil is producing in in their lives and they eventually be demonized and as you look at this country and look at this continent of africa there are many people that are demonized already influenced by demons possessed by demons because of running after the lying wonders in first timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 first timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith have you seen some people that have been in the faith before and then because of a problem because of sickness because of maybe uh, a kind of hindrance in their lives or because of marriage or because of bearing children or because of looking for job and they are prayed on their own and they are prayed in the church and you know, they have not been answered apparently and then they say well i'm going on a journey i'll be going from assembly to assembly from fellowship to fellowship from one new generation church to another new generation church i'll be going anywhere i can find deliverance ministry i need deliverance by all means and eventually they depart from the faith and then they plunge themselves into some terrible terrible things error that you will not believe what you are hearing when they begin to speak to you and this and, and you see what they have gone into it says they shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits deceiving spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron they come to the point eventually they're totally demonized the demonization of countless miracle seekers and then now number seven the damnation of counterfeit miracle workers the damnation of counterfeit 
miracle workers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm looking at it from verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 13. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They will tell you that they belong to Christ too. In fact, they might even mention it, the name of a pastor, the name of a preacher you respect, and they will say that we're together. We're doing the same thing. And actually, you know, we, we, we use the same outline, and we're going the same direction. And in fact, I saw him, and he laid hands on me, and this is how these things are happening. They will tell you lies and transform themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel in verse 14, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great sin if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And that's the reason you need to be careful. In these last days in which we are living, so that you will not be deceived by the power and the wonders of counterfeit religion. We come now to point number two. Point number two, diligent watchfulness and preparedness for Christ's return. Diligent watchfulness and preparedness for Christ's return. We're now back to Revelation chapter 16. In Revelation chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and the sea is shame. The Lord here is calling his own people to watchfulness. And it is to be diligent watchfulness and preparedness for return of the Lord, for the coming of Christ. And for us, it means that we ought to prepare for the rapture. We ought to prepare when the Lord will sound the trumpet. And when the angel will sound the trumpet, and the Lord will appear, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. It needs preparation. That's exactly what the Lord is saying here. Behold, I come as a thief. Uh, what does he mean? I come as a thief. Number one, it means I come suddenly when most people are not prepared. You see, when thieves come, many people are not prepared. Many people are not ready. And that's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, I'm going to come. When many people are not prepared as a thief in the night. Number two, what it means is it will be coming unannounced, unexpectedly, at such an hour as we think not. Number three, he will be coming to take only what is precious and valuable to him, and then he will leave behind what is worthless and useless. Tell me, when a thief comes in the night to a house, does the thief carry everything in the house? No, not at all. Only the things that are precious to that thief, that the thief will carry away. And then he will leave the things that are useless and worthless. He'll leave all those things behind. And the Lord is saying, I am coming. And when I come, I'm not going to take everybody in the world. I'm going to take those people that are precious to me. Who are the people that are precious to the Lord? Those who are saved. Those who are sanctified, those who are obedient to the word of God, those who are walking in righteousness, and those who are walking with the Lord, those who are dedicated and consecrated, committed unto the Lord, those who are watching for their Lord's return, those are the people that are valuable, precious, peculiar treasures to the Lord, and those are the people he's going to take away when he comes. The question is, are you like that? Or are you a useless churchgoer? coming and going, crawling in and crawling out, and you are worthless to the Lord. When the Lord comes, it's not going to take the people that are useless or the people that are worthless or the people that are not serving him or the people that have not been saved, the people that have not been sanctified, the people that are not holy. is going to take the precious, valuable, peculiar treasures to himself. Number four, when he says, I'm coming like a thief, when a thief comes, the thief does not stay. The thief comes all of a sudden, takes what he wants to take, and then he goes away. And that's what the Lord is saying. I am coming again, and I'm not coming to stay. I'm not going to remain here, there in the earth, but I'll be coming for a purpose and returning to my heavenly home. And in view of the coming of the Lord, that's why the Lord is saying, watch. Let us first of all see the announcement of the coming of the Lord over and over in Scripture. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, 
and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so. Amen. And the Lord is telling us there that he is coming. And there's a testimony, there is the utterance everywhere in Scripture, especially in this book of Revelation, that Christ is coming, is coming, is coming again. And we look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Revelation chapter 3, looking at verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Hold it fast. What you have, what is that? What will qualify you to see the Lord? Your salvation? The righteousness? The grace of God? The goodness of God in your life? And the privileges the Lord has given you and the spiritual important things the Lord has given you, those indispensable qualities of the Christian life, hold them fast. And the sound doctrine of the word of God, the devil will fight that every turn of the way. But the Lord is saying, hold what you have, hold it firm, hold it fast, so that nobody will take your crown. In Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, again we're looking at what the Lord is saying to his own people. Revelation chapter 22 verse 7 It tells us Behold I come quickly Blessed is he that keepeth the sins Of the prophecy of this book that is the people that the Lord will be coming for. They are the people that are keeping to the word of God. And it will not be the careless people, the backsliding people, the nonchalant people, the carefree people, the I don't care what happens people. They are the people that care and they are the people that cherish the word of God. In verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. What's your work like? Because we are created unto good works that we shall walk in them. And when the Lord comes, it will be coming for the people that are very diligent in serving the Lord. And then he tells us in, uh, the, in, in verse 20 there, in verse 20, he tells us, He that testified these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. There should be no doubt in your heart at all that the Lord is coming. And if you are not going to regret when he comes, if you are not going to be ashamed when he comes, you must abide in the truth. Abide in the word of God. Abide in the experiences that the Lord has given you. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now little children, abide in him. Abide in the word of God. Abide in the love of God. Abide in the word. Abide in obedience. Abide in your faith in the Lord. Little children, young converts, and people of God, abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That is, if you are not going to be ashamed that he's coming, you'll abide in the Lord. All the things you have learned, all the things you have known, everything the Lord has revealed to you, you abide in them. In First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. We're talking about preparing for the coming of the Lord. And it says the people that will be ready. And the people that the Lord is coming for, the people of the world will not recognize you. And tell me, if you go into politics, uh, uh, the people of the world, they have to recognize you before they can vote for you. And you have to go their way and do their thing and speak their language and dance to their tune a little bit at least before they'll be able to accept you and if you're going to make it you are not going if you're going to make the rapture if you're going to be ready when the lord will come you are not going to be accepted by the people of the world and therefore if you've been running about and you want the people of the world to receive you don't you know the things that are praised in the world they are abomination unto the lord if you are preparing for the coming of the lord see what it says before Behold what manner of love the Father has loved us, has bestowed upon us, that we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 
Beloved now, are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him when he shall come. Because we have a kind of resurrection body. A kind of body that will never die again, that will never feel pain again, no sickness again, nothing of that nature again. We shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. But it is very important. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Those are the people that the Lord will be coming for. Those are the people that will be ready for the coming of the Lord for the rapture. Every man that has this hope in him. Every woman that has this soap in him, every boy, every girl that has this soap in him, it is the same standard. It is the same requirement. We need to be saved, born again. And we need to have the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ within us, and the sanctified heart, and the sanctified life, and the holy, pure life we ought to have. If we're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, every man that has this soap in him purifies himself, even as he, Christ, is pure. And that's what the Lord is telling us in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we're looking at it from verse 42. It's telling us that we need to prepare. We need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself before he led his disciples here in the world. In uh, Matthew chapter 24 verse 42. Watch ye, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. You don't know. That's why there's no room for carelessness. There's no room to indulge in bitterness and to indulge in grudges and to indulge in complaints and to indulge in tail bearing and to indulge in any sin, whether it is a small sin, a little sin, a hidden sin, a secret sin, a besetting sin. There is no chance at all, there is no time at all to indulge in anything that is wrong because it says in that verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. In verse 43, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what hour, in what watch, the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered, permitted his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. In such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Still telling us that it is when people do not expect that the Lord will come. That's the time he will come. And you know there are people that they are careless with their Christian lives. And while the spirit of the Lord is turning them up and warning them and reminding them, make right your way. Shape up. Sit up, sit right, live right. This careless life, if the Lord comes and meets you in this condition, you'll be lost forever. You know, there are some people that will just continue like, the Lord cannot come now. The Lord cannot come. How do you know the Lord cannot come now? Because it is at such an hour at, as you think not, the Lord will come. In fact, he tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading there from verse 2, it says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And then he tells us in verse 4, it says, But ye, brethren, and not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Don't let us live careless lives as the people that do not know that the Lord is coming. If we're going to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, what kind of life should we be living? Well, this kind of life, you cannot live it except you are born again. This kind of life, you cannot live it except your life is full of the grace of God, the grace that comes at salvation. And the grace that comes at sanctification. The grace that makes us righteous and holy and godly. Without that grace, there's no way you can live like this. Look at it yourself. In Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter 
chapter 3. Here is what he takes. And with what he takes here, you know, this goes beyond human effort. It takes the grace of God. It takes divine mercy and love and power coming upon our lives, turning us around so that we'll be who he wants us to be. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. That is the coming of the, the promise of the coming of the Lord. Uh, some people are saying, but how many times have I heard the Lord is coming? The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. And he has not come. And the Lord is telling us here, the word of God is telling us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men come slackness, but his long suffering to us, watch, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. Not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. What's the implication of that? Those who don't come to repentance will perish. Those who don't turn from their wicked ways will perish. Those who do not yield to the word of God, surrender to the word of God, and make it turning around, they will perish. And the Lord doesn't want us to perish. That is why the Lord has not come. And then he says, uh, he tells us in verse 10, But the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, the Lord is telling us that many things that people are running after. I must have this. I must have this. I must have this. All those things will be burnt in fire. And there are people that are not preparing to meet the Lord. And they are not, they are not getting saved. They are not getting sanctified. They are not living the life. They are not seeking for the grace of God that will prepare them for the coming of the Lord. Why? Because they are busy looking for money. They are busy looking for material things. And it says the whole earth and the elements thereof and the works that are therein are going to be burnt up with fervent heat. And then he said in verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness? It takes that holy conversation. And it takes that holy lifestyle, it takes that pure lifestyle, and it takes that heart of holiness and righteousness before we'll be able to meet the Lord when he comes. That's why it says in verse 12, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, in verse 14, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and uh, blameless. That's what the Lord is telling us, and the Lord is telling us we ought to watch, we ought to watch. It tells us in Mark chapter 13. Mark Chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 33. In Mark chapter 13, verse 33, here is what the Lord himself is saying to every believer, to every one of us here. It says, take ye, take, take ye heed, watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. Take heed, watch and pray. Here the Lord is telling us something. He tells us, watch and pray. Uh, maybe you want to write this now. Number one, watch and pray. You're watching over the things that the Lord has given you. You're watching over the precious experiences that you have. Watch. Watch and pray. Two, wait and prepare. Be as the people that are waiting for their Lord. And that time of waiting is not time of indolence. It's not time of idleness. It's not time of doing nothing. It is a time of preparation. You wait and you prepare. Number three, your worship and your praise. While you are waiting, while you are waiting and watching and praying, you are worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. And you are praising the Lord. And your life is full of praise. That's how to wait. When, when the Bible says you are waiting, you are watching, it's not just that you are blank. You are empty. You are not thinking about anything. You're not meditating on the word of God. You're not worshiping the Lord. No. The time of watching, the time of waiting, is time of worshiping. While you are here waiting for the coming of the Lord, you are worshiping and you are praising the Lord. Number four, you are witnessing and preaching. Witness and preach. Because that's the reason why we're even waiting here to start with. Because he said, occupy until I come. The watching and the praying is not a kind of idle watching, indolent watching. We're witnessing and preaching. 
Because he says, shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. And to the uttermost part of the earth, you'll be witnessing and preaching. Going into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature and preach the word. Out of season and in season and out of season. You rebuke, you reprove with all long suffering and doctrine. Because this is the time the time has come. When men will not endure sound doctrine, you'll be witnessing and preaching. Number five, win and preserve. The reason why you are preaching and the reason why you are witnessing is that you are winning souls. And those souls you are witnessing to and you are winning them to the Lord, you preserve them. When the Lord comes, the Lord will be asking you, you had five talents, how many have you won? And then you have two talents, how many have you gained? If you just say, well, I tried, but the people that I won, I couldn't keep them. I couldn't preserve them. Then there's not going to be any reward. But you'll be winning and preserving. Number six, you work and persevere. Sometimes it's going to be an uphill task, working for the Lord. Sometimes it's going to be a rough road walking for the Lord. Sometimes the situation is going to be tough while you're walking for the Lord. But if you're the kind of person that likes everything easy, you know, I'll preach if it's easy to preach. I'll witness if it's easy. I'll walk for the Lord if it's easy. If you're looking for the easy way out, you're not going to serve the Lord with perseverance. You work and you persevere. And then number seven, you walk in purity. Walk in purity. You are walking with the Lord. You are walking in holiness. You are walking in righteousness. You are walking in purity. Because it is that that will get you ready and get you prepared for the coming of the Lord. You watch and pray. You wait and prepare. You worship and praise. You witness and you preach. You win and you preserve. You work and persevere. You walk in purity. And that's what the Lord is telling us. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 16. In Revelation chapter 16, uh, the Lord God is telling us in verse 15 he tells us in verse 15 behold i come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment lest he walk naked and the sea is shame what the lord is telling us to keep is that we are watching over our garment what kind of garment is see this one we're wearing no this one only covers the body it's talking of the garment that covers the soul it's talking about the garment that preserves and protects the soul from the judgment of God. It's talking about the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness. That's what you have to watch. When you get saved, that's what you have, the garment of salvation. Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 61, reading there in verse 10, the garment of salvation the robe of righteousness i will greatly rejoice in the lord my soul shall be joyful in my god for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness that's what the lord is telling us to preserve when he said watch so that you'll keep your garments. It's a garment of salvation that you have got. Keep it so that nobody will take it away from you. The devil will contend with that salvation. And people of the world, persecutors, will contend with that salvation. But you are to hold fast. Even if it takes your very life, you hold fast to that salvation, that righteousness. The Lord has given you. I'm reading Revelation chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verses 4 and five thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy he that overcometh and the same shall be clothed in white raiment white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels do you see the white raiment there what's that talking about that's a righteousness that's a holiness in Revelation chapter 19 I'm reading from verse 7 and from verse 8 be, let us be glad and rejoice give on and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine, leaning, clean, and wide. 
clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints that's what the lord is telling us to preserve that's what the lord is telling us to keep and he's saying blessed are those people that are watching and they're keeping their garments lest they walk naked and people see their shame i come to the last point now which is devastating warfare and punishment of contemptuous reprobates devastating warfare and punishment of contemptuous reprobates in revelation chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 16 revelation chapter 16 reading from verse 16 and he gathered them together unto a place called in the hebrew tongue a magedon and the seventh angel poured out his veil into the air and there came a great voice and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done it is done then it said and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great babylon came in remembrance before god to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon many great hill or out of heaven and every stone about the wage of a talent if you can think of a bag of cement and it's like a stone as heavy as a bag of cement coming from heaven coming from the sky and falling upon men falling upon men that's how terrible it will be and then people just be crushed to death and those who are those who do not die it says and men blasphemed god because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great it was exceedingly terrible now you will see that at the end of time that is when the great tribulation will be coming to a close at that time there will be this great battle in a particular place that is called a magedon that is the mount of megiddo mount megiddo that's about 60 miles north of jerusalem and the battle of Armageddon will complete God's wrath and it immediately precedes the second coming of Christ. I hope you understand. We're waiting for the rapture now. Anytime from now, the rapture may take place. Immediately after the rapture, there will be the great tribulation. And that will take place for seven years here on earth. And then after that seven year, after that seven year period, there will be the second coming of the Lord. That is, it will appear. And that's the time when it will be for the repentance, national repentance of the people of Israel. And that time, it will bring the worst calamity in the history of the world, the climax of the wrath of God will be a devastating earthquake as we read it now in these uh, closing verses of chapter 16. It will be the most terrible earthquake in earth's history. And then he tells us at that time, Babylon will come into remembrance before the Lord to give unto her the wine, the cup of the wine of the fierceness of the wrath of God. Babylon actually will be the center or the capital of the Antichrist's empire in the last days at the time of the great tribulation. And it will receive a special outpouring of the wrath of God. These plagues and these judgments will not convert the followers and the worshippers of the Antichrist. I wish a suffering will convert people. I wish that uh, the, the wrath of God will just turn people around. But no, it doesn't. And it tells us that they'll be fighting against the Almighty God. In Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. Uh, let us see what uh, is going to be happening at the end of time. It's what we read about already in uh, Revelation chapter uh, 16. In those uh, closing verses of that chapter. And yet uh, all the parts of the Bible tell us about uh, the things that will be happening. At that time, the great battle uh, that is called the great battle of Armageddon. In Joel chapter 3, here it is in a uh, reading from verse, uh, verse 9. Let us go to verse Verse 2 falls. Joel chapter 3, verse 2. I will also gather all nations and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Then in verse 9, proclaim ye among the Gentiles, prepare war. 
wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into, into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Actually, when we quote that, uh, many people, many times, we quote it out of context. It's actually talking of the time of the battle of Armageddon. In the last day, when the Lord will say, nobody has risen to be weak now. It's going to be a great battle. And the people of the world are going to be destroyed and devastated and damned. And anybody that is feeling weak, get up, be strong, and then come into this fight. Because he'll open up the way of the river Euphrates that the kings of the earth and the whole kings of the whole world will gather to that battle. And then it says in verse 11, assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. See the cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I seek to judge all the heathen round about. Put, in your, put, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fat over, and the fats overflow, and for their wickedness is great. And then it says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. That's the valley of uh, that Armageddon. It says in the valley of uh, decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And as John spoke about it, my Micah also spoke about it. In Micah chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. Micah chapter 4, reading from verse 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, let her be defiled. Let our eye look upon Zion, but they know not the thoughts of the Lord. Neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and stretch, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate thee again unto the Lord, and their soft Substance unto the Lord of the whole earth is telling us that it will be a great time, great, great judgment in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14 is telling us in verses 4 and 5, still reminding us that this will be the time, a great time indeed, very near the time, the end of the world, a very near the time when uh, that uh, great tribulation will come to an end and then the Lord Jesus Christ will come. And it says uh, in uh, this uh, verse 14, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, unto the end uh, uh, up on, on the east, and then it says, And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains. For the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Israel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah the king of Judah and the Lord my God shall come and all saints with thee. It's telling us that there will be a time of trouble, a time of great tribulation, a time when many people uh, will suffer and I pray that you will not be in the world at that time. If you are not going to be at the, in the world at that time it means that you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You would have been born again in, in Isaiah chapter 8. I'm reading from verse Verse 21, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 21. And it shall pass through it, hardly be stead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And that's what we are saying, that at that time of judgment, at that time of the great devastation, the people will not turn to the Lord. They will still be cursing the Lord. They will still be blaspheming the Lord. In verse 22, and they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to 
darkness. And that's the reason why you need to make up your mind because the Lord is calling you to a decision. Where are you going to be on that day when that great devastation will be taking place? What's the decision today? Do you know the Lord? Are you a real child of God or you are still just there and they say, well, I don't know what is happening. I'm having this problem. And you are concentrating on problems. Those things will not matter when the trumpet shall sound and the people of God shall be taken away. The Lord is calling everyone to a decision today and you need to make up your mind. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're looking at a verse 19 and verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 19 and verse 20. Please remember that uh, the, the judgment that is coming, the damnation that is coming will be irreversible. Those things are going to take place and they will come and when they come, people will continue to blaspheme the Lord until they are totally, eternally banished from the Lord and they are consigned forever and ever to the lake of fire. And where are you where are you thinking you'll spend eternity if you have not been born again? That's why you need to make up your mind today. And the Lord said, this is Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that thou and thy seed may live. This is still the day of mercy, not the day of wrath yet. Not the day of judgment yet. Not the day of irreversible judgment of God yet. This is the time you can choose the Lord. This is the time you can get saved. This is the time you can be born again. This is the time you can be sanctified and made holy and godly and righteous through and through. And the Lord is saying, I'm setting before you the blessing of salvation. Or maybe the curse of damnation. If you are not making the right choice. I'm setting before you life and death. Eternal life or the second death in the lake of fire. But now he's counseling you, commanding you. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. In verse 20 that thou mayest love the Lord thy God. And that thou mayest obey his voice. And that thou mayest cleave unto, the, unto him. For he is thy life. And the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob to give unto them what will your testimony be will your testimony be that you have chosen the way of truth that you have chosen the Lord you have chosen to get saved and you have chosen to remain holy in the Lord in Psalm 119 verse 30 Psalm 119 verse 30 119 of the Psalms verse touching i have chosen the way of truth i have chosen the way of truth what's your choice today where do you stand today when the lord shall come and gather home his people where will you be on that day you will be in heaven you'll be with the lord if you will choose the way of the truth today and then you make up your mind the way of truth i've chosen today and the way of salvation i've chosen today come with me temptation trial persecution or opposition i will never leave this way this thing that i've chosen nobody will take it away from me make up your mind rise up now and tell the lord in prayer what you are choosing today what you are coming to today are you born again? Are you a child of God? Have you repented of your sin? Or are you just to do that today? Why don't you give your life to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I want to give myself to the Lord. I want to give myself fully unto the Lord. I do not want to remain in my sin. The opportunity is knocking at your door today. The voice of the Lord is calling you today. You can repent today if you have not repented. If you have not been born again, this is another chance for you. Don't waste this opportunity and don't play away your soul don't joke with your salvation and don't throw away such a great opportunity like this as the lord is calling you come as the lord is calling you give yourself to the lord as the lord is calling you repent of your sin as the lord is calling you this is the time to be serious with things of eternity and to say lord i've heard your voice come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest the lord is calling you the lord is saying come now let us reason to Together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as colored, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, I make you whiter than snow and white as wool. The Lord is calling you. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the goods of the land. But if you don't repent, if you don't give your life to the Lord, you are going to perish. You are going to perish because the soul that sinneth it shall die. 
the Lord is calling you by his love. The Lord is calling you by his word. The Lord is calling you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Lord has died for you. Jesus died for you. He died to save you. He died to cleanse you. He died to take away your sin. The grave that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly laws. And that we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. They will be looking for the coming of the Lord. The Lord is calling you today. Why don't you surrender to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I surrender. Yes, Lord, I give myself to you. This is the day you are there. You can, you know, lift up your heart to the Lord and lift up your mind to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm deciding today. I'm deciding today. All the sins in your life, all the evil in your life, all the carelessness in your life, all the backsliding that you have gone into, all the secret sin that you have gone into, the Lord is calling you today and saying, come, come, repent and turn away from your evil and let there be a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of life and let the blood of Jesus Christ wash you whiter than snow and let him make a change in your life and reconcile you to the Father. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature, it's a new creature. Are you a new creature yet? It's your your life new yet is your attitude new yet is your character new yet is your mind new yet if any man be in christ is a new creature all things are passed away the life of lying is gone the life of deception is gone and the life of selfishness is gone and the life of secret sin is gone the life of adultery is gone and the life of fornication is gone and the life of fraud 419 business that life is gone if any man be in christ is a new creature all things are passed away and behold all things have become new the Lord is calling you today why don't you make up your mind how long are you going to stay in sin how long are you going to stay with Satan how long are you going to stay rejecting the offer of the grace of God come today come today and receive the Lord today man may not know the sin you are committing women may not know the sin you are committing your wife may not know your husband may not know your friends may not know the church may not know but the Lord knows your heart are you ready for the coming of the Lord are you ready for the coming of the Lord and if you have been the one that has gone astray because you are running after miracles counterfeit miracles counterfeit signs and wonders lying wonders you'll come back from the wilderness that you have wandered into and you'll say Lord I'm not looking for all those deceptive miracles anymore. All those counterfeit miracles anymore. I'm not searching for, I'm not running after all those lying wonders anymore. I give myself to you. I surrender myself to you. I'm just, I just want the Lord. I want the Lord in my heart, the Lord in my soul, the Lord in my life. I want him through and through in my life. That's what I want now. I'm not looking for counterfeit miracles and lying wonders anymore. Oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. Cleanse me from all sin and all those sins that will be in me running after the wrong thing, running in the wrong direction. Oh Lord, take everything away from me. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I give myself to you. I don't want to be distracted away from the message of Christ. I do not want to disregard the message and the watch of the Lord. I'm not looking for cheap miracles, lying wonders, and deceptive miracles, counterfeit miracles. I want you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I want you in my heart. I want you in my soul. I want you in my mind. I want you, Lord, in my heart, in my life, in the day, in the afternoon, in the night. I want to live only to your glory. And the Lord is saying that it's coming again. The Lord is coming again. The Lord is coming again. The Lord is coming again. And the Lord can come at any time. And the Lord is saying, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch over your life. Watch over your attitude. And watch over your tongue. And watch over the precious salvation the Lord has given you. Watch over the sanctification experience the Lord has given you. Watch, watch, watch and pray. The devil wants to take that precious sin away from you. The precious, the precious sin you have, the salvation you have, the holiness you have, the sanctification you have, the godliness you have, the decisions you have, and the consecrations you have made. The devil wants to take it away from you. But you watch and you pray. And then you are waiting for the Lord. You are waiting for the Lord. Don't be impatient. Don't be impatient. Wait for the Lord and prepare. Prepare for the coming of the Lord. Who knows when the Lord will come? In the day, in the night, in the evening. Whenever the Lord will come, keep on waiting for him. Keep on waiting for him. And while you are waiting and preparing, you are worshiping and praising the Lord. 
you are worshiping and praising the Lord. You will not allow a day of worship to pass by. You will be praising. You will not allow a study day to pass by. You will be there. You will not allow any meeting revival day to pass by. You will be there. You are worshiping the Lord. You are praising the Lord. And at every opportunity you are witnessing. You are witnessing and you are preaching the gospel. Witness and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to every creature. In your place of work, preach the gospel. In your home, preach the gospel. In your community, preach the gospel. In your school, preach the gospel. Everywhere you find yourself, preach the gospel. You'll be witnessing and preaching. And you're winning souls and you're preserving them. You're winning souls and you're preserving them. You're winning souls and you're preserving them. Are you, are, are you barren in the sight of the Lord? Spiritually barren? No convert? No convert? You're not winning anyone to the Lord. And as you say, you're winning them to the Lord. You're not keeping them in the Lord. You win them and you preserve them. Are you working to, are you persevering in the work of God? Are you working and persevering in the work of God? Are you easily tired? Opposition makes you tired? Rejection makes you tired? Abuse makes you tired? The insult of the people makes you tired? The rejection, the reactions of the people makes you tired? Make up your mind again and come back to the work of the Lord. Work and persevere. And then you'll be walking in purity of life. You are walking in purity of life. Oh Lord, help me your sin. Because the Bible says, He that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The Lord is calling you to a decision today. The Lord is calling you to a decision today. And the Lord is saying, make up your mind. I said before you life and death. I said before you blessing and cursing. Choose life and choose blessing that you may live and that your seed may live as well. Make up your mind. You want to serve the Lord. Make up your mind. You're not going to allow anything to distract your attention. Make up your mind. You're not going to allow anything to turn you back. You're going to serve the Lord. You're going to keep with the Lord even till you see the Lord face to face. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. That salvation, keep it. That sanctification, keep it. That holiness, keep it. That godliness, keep it. And that conviction the Lord has given you to stand on the word of God without looking back, without compromising with anyone in any way at any time. Keep that consecration and don't compromise at all. And then when the Lord shall come, when the Lord shall come and the Lord shall call his people home, then you will be there and the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a little thing and make you ruler over many, many things. Today is the day to make up your mind. Today is the day to call upon the Lord. Today is the day to say, Lord, I'm not going to look back again. If you have been a person giving to backsliding, a person that is giving to going back, a person that is giving to compromising, today is the time you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, no compromise again. Oh Lord, no falling back again. Oh Lord, no lukewarmness again. Oh Lord, no complaining again. Oh Lord, no tiredness again. Oh Lord, no spiritual weakness again. I want to be strong in the Lord. I want to be strong in the grace of God. You talk to the Lord. Make sure that you are talking to the Lord. You are talking to the Lord. You want the Lord to prepare you until the Lord or for the coming of the Lord. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord that, oh Lord, here I am. I give myself to you afresh. You have not been born again. You must be born again before you go. You have not been sanctified. You ought to be sanctified before you go. And you are back reading. You ought to be restored before you go. And you have been compromising and letting down the standard. You need to give yourself to God and say, Lord, no more compromise. Make it, make up your mind and your purpose in your heart. You will not defile yourself with anything that is going on around you. That you are going to yield yourself fully unto the Lord and then revival will come to your soul. Reformation, refining will come to your soul. And the spirit of the Lord will work mightily in your heart and in your life. And the fire of the Holy Ghost will be burning within that the devil will not be able to cheat you again and get your back into your old lifestyle anymore that you are saying, oh Lord, oh Lord, set me on fire. Set me on fire for you. So that, Lord, your glory will be seen in me. Your holiness will be seen in me. The life of Christ will be reproduced in me. The Lord is calling you. Calling you to get yourself prepared for the coming of the Lord. This is your chance. This is your chance. 
Who knows the last Bible study you are going to attend before you go to the great beyond? Who knows the last prayer you are going to pray before you go to the great beyond? Who knows the last opportunity you are going to have before you go to the great beyond? That's why the Lord is telling you, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this chance. The Lord is calling you. And the Lord is saying, this is the time to choose life. And this is the time to choose the blessing of God. And the blessing of God is available. That's the blessing of salvation. And the blessing of sanctification. And the blessing of preparedness and readiness for the coming of the Lord. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. The Lord is coming. He will come as a thief in the night. He will not announce when he will come. He will come suddenly. He will come unexpectedly. That's the reason why if you are a wise virgin, a wise virgin, you prepare yourself. Don't be like the foolish virgins that knew the Lord was coming, but they did not prepare themselves. Prepare yourself and say, Oh Lord, I want to be ready. I want to be ready when the Lord shall come. I want to be ready when the Lord shall come. Can you be ready without holiness? Can you be ready without sanctification? Can you be ready with a stubborn heart? Can you be ready with a stony heart? Can you be ready without circumcision of heart? Can you be ready without revival in your soul? Can you be ready without total obedience to the Lord? Can you be ready without yielding yourself as a faithful, loyal servant of the Lord? That's why you are telling the Lord today, Lord, I want to be ready. Lord, I want to be ready. Lord, I want to be ready. Make me ready. Make me ready. Make me ready. Cleanse me with the blood of the Lamb and grant me, Lord, the experience that will get me ready for the rapture, ready for the coming of the Lord. The Lord is saying, Day this is your chance. This is your opportunity. And if you miss the rapture, you don't have anybody to blame because the Lord has told you. It says, blessed are those that are watching. And they keep their garments of righteousness, their garment of salvation, and their garment of holiness. Unless they walk naked and people see their shame. That fine linen, that garment is the righteousness of the saints. Receive it before you go and keep it for the rest of your life. That nothing will take it away from you again.